Now, how many of you ever woken up from a dream and you think, was that God? That was an unusual dream. Now, if you've ever had a spiritual dream, I've only had two in my lifetime. Actually, three, but two that were so impactful. I knew immediately that it was. But, you know, sometimes, even then you question, wow. Last week, I told you about our family tradition of reading the Christmas story before we open gifts on Christmas morning. Lisa and I started this tradition because we wanted to make sure that our children understood the real reason for the season, which of course is Jesus Christ. We wanted them to know that Christmas is not about a fat man wearing a red suit sliding down a chimney in order to give kids toys and candies for being good all year long. No, we wanted them to know that Christmas is all about celebrating the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, to be honest with you, I get more out of reading the Christmas story than my children do. And yes, we still read it today. My oldest is 33. My youngest is 30. On Christmas morning, we will pull out the gospel and we will begin reading the Christmas story. But the reason I get so much out of it is because every time I read it, I learn something new. Or I see something that I've never seen before. In fact, I can't tell you the number of times that I've learned a life lesson. Something that I can apply to my personal life from one of the characters in the story. And last week I shared with you what I've learned from Mary, the mother of Jesus. But to be honest with you, I just scratched the surface. So this morning I want to dig a little bit deeper. And I'm going to talk about some of the things that I alluded to last week. But I didn't really discuss because of time. Now, the reason I want to go a little bit deeper and discuss them is because those things are really interesting, but they're also very important. And I believe they'll make the Christmas story much more meaningful to you and your family. So turn with me, if you would, to the book of Luke, chapter 1. We're going to start reading in verse number 26 and read to verse 31. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus. Now, Nazareth was in Galilee, not Judea. And it's located in the land that was allotted to the tribe of Zebulun. In fact, it's right next to the border with, of the land to the, that was granted to the tribe of Naphtali. And most of you probably grew up pronouncing that Naphtali. How many of you grew up pronouncing it Naphtali? That's the way I always pronounced it until I went to Israel. In the third trip, one of my guides was named Naphtali. And I saw his little name card. I said, oh, so your name's Naphtali. He said, you're an American. I said, yes, I am. He said, no, my name is Naphtali. I'm from the tribe of Naphtali. They are not lost tribes. When uh, they came back from the captivity, Assyria was underneath them. And so even those in the northern kingdom were allowed to come back. So they still know what tribes they are from. But anyways, I want you to know that Nazareth is in the land that's allotted to the tribe of Zebulun. But it's right on the border with the land that was allotted to the tribe of Naphtali. Take a look at this map and you'll see what I'm talking about. Right up here is Esachar and this is Zebulun. Where Nazareth is, is right here at the very top. In fact, it's halfway between the Sea of Galilee and the Mediterranean Sea. It's 15 miles to the Sea of Galilee and about 20 miles to the Mediterranean Sea. But it's up here on the top. But it's right on that border to Naphtali. That's exactly where it's located. So, if Joseph and Mary were from the tribe of Judah, why were they living in Nazareth rather than Bethlehem, which was their ancestral home and located in the land that was allotted to the tribe of Judah? Does anyone know? Well, let me give you a quick history lesson that it will answer this question and possibly answer a few more questions. And we'll start with the death of Alexander the Great. After Alexander the Great died in 323 BC, his kingdom was divided between his four generals. In fact, if you remember what legend says, legend says when he was asked who was going to inherit his kingdom, he said, let the, fight, let the strong fight for it. In other words, he was going to allow them to fight for it, but his generals were pretty wise. And they realized that no one was going to win in a situation like that. So they divided his kingdom among his four generals. Cassander, who took Macedonia in the western part of the empire, in fact, that was considered to be the prize. 
So we know that Cassander was the strongest of all the generals and so was his army. Lysimachus, who took Thrace in the northern part of the empire. Seleucus, who took Syria in the eastern part. And Ptolemy, who took Egypt in the southern part of the empire. Here's a map of how it was divided. Take a look at this. Everyone see it? If you don't know... This is the Mediterranean Sea. Here's Italy that's here. Come over here into Greece. So you're seeing this. This is Cassander. He took this far western part. Lysimachus took what is now modern day Turkey, went over into uh, above. Here's still southern Turkey, but it's the majority of Turkey. And then you had Seleucus who took this eastern part. Persian Empire comes into Syria. And then you had Ptolemy. Ptolemy took this part, which is Egypt. But if you notice, why don't you take a look? Where's that? Well, we'll find out in just a second. But anyways. Here's how it was divided if you take a look at that. Now, hopefully you noticed because I pointed it out that Israel was in the area that was given to Ptolemy. Remember that because that has a direct bearing as, as to why Joseph and Mary were up at Nazareth and living there and not in Bethlehem. You see, one of Seleucus' descendants was Antiochus Epiphanes. Anyone ever heard of Antiochus Epiphanes? Antiochus Epiphanes began reigning in 175 BC and he reigned for nine years from 175 to 164 BC. Now when he became ruler, he immediately began expanding his kingdom by pushing to the east and to the south, just like Daniel predicted he would. You see, the last book of the Bible to be written was Malachi. And that's usually referred to after Malachi in 400 BC to all the way to Jesus Christ is referred to as the silent years. They're really not silent. And the reason they're not is because Daniel told us what would happen during that time. He told us about the four generals. He told us about what Antiochus Epiphanes would do. But anyways, when he became ruler, he immediately began expanding his kingdom by pushing to the east and to the south, just like Daniel predicted that he would. He invaded Egypt and he overran it, except for Alexandria. In fact, he took all of the Sinai Peninsula where all of the garrisons were. He went to what today would be considered modern-day Cairo. He overran it, took Memphis, took Thebes, took Luxor, and he was headed to Alexandria. And the reason he didn't overrun Alexandria was because as he was marching there, a messenger of Rome met him. And the messenger told him that he must immediately withdraw from Egypt. Antiochus responded that he would discuss it with his council. As soon as the messenger heard that, he pulled out his sword and he drew a circle around Antiochus. And he said, before you cross the circle, I want you to give an answer to the Senate in Rome. Implying that if he stepped out of the circle without agreeing, Rome would immediately declare war upon him, so he withdrew in humiliation. Now, guess whose land he had to cross going home and who he took his wrath out upon? You got it. Israel. Look back at this map. If you notice, this is the land of Ptolemy. So when Antiochus Epiphanes came down, what he did is he came through the Jezreel Valley and at Megiddo, he went through the pass, took the king's highway down, actually called the Coastal Highway. He came into what today is called the Sinai Peninsula. He took all of the garrisons. He marched down here, took where modern day uh, Cairo is, went on down, took Luxor and all of the other places. And as he was marching to Alexandria, that's what took place with this messenger from Rome. So he's humiliated. And now that he's humiliated, he is so angry. And you know, when you're angry, you want to kick the cat, right? You want to kick the dog. Well, he's coming back. He has to come back. And when he's coming back, he's going to make a stop. And he's going to take his wrath out on Israel. So in his anger at being thwarted, this is what he did. First of all, he plundered Jerusalem. He sacked it. He didn't tear down the walls, really didn't have to. They had submitted unto him, but he went in and he just sacked it. Secondly, he outlawed the Jewish religion and replaced it with Greek worship. So he took down everything and in every place that they had, and he put up all of these Greek gods, because of course Greeks were into polytheism, which is a multitude of gods. Number three, he outlawed the observance of the Sabbath. No longer could you not work on the Sabbath, but you were required to work on the Sabbath and you were not to be seen worshiping on the Sabbath. He outlawed circumcision. Big deal. He outlawed the reading of scriptures. 
He burned whatever scriptures he could. If you remember, this is after the Babylonian captivity. So now every city has synagogues. So he sent his army into all the synagogues. He went into what is called the room of Moses. He took all of the Torahs out and he began burning them. He sacrificed a pig on the altar at the temple. Now remember, pigs are unclean animals and he purposely did this in order to pollute the altar. He then set up an idol in the temple, which was blasphemy. He, compl he compelled idol worship. And last but not least, he claimed he was God manifested in the flesh. That's where Epiphanes comes from. He's an epiphany. He's a revelation of God. So Antiochus Epiphanes, he claimed he was God manifest in the flesh and he demanded to be worshipped. In fact, he was a type of the Antichrist. David alludes to him. The reason we know that he was not the Antichrist and what he performed was not the abomination of desolation is because Jesus refers to the future uh, abomination of desolation. Before him, many people thought he was actually the fulfillment of what Daniel was predicting. But Jesus taught us, no, he was not the fulfillment of what Daniel predicted, but he's a type of the Antichrist because everything that he did is exactly what the Antichrist will do when he comes. Well, in order to continue observing the Mosaic law and escape persecution, a large group of families from Jerusalem, Bethlehem, and the surrounding villages in the land that was allotted to Judea, they left Judea and they traveled to the Galilean area and they began their own Jewish colony. The colony they set up was named Nazareth. And the majority of the families were what we would call today Davidites. Anyone ever heard that term? Davidites? That's what scholars refer to them. In other words, they belonged to the house and line of David and they believed that the Messiah would come through their lineage. And to ensure that they kept their descent pure, they did not marry outside of the royal line. That's why Mary's genealogy and Joseph's genealogy both trace back to David. The reason they were getting married is because they kept within the royal line. They were Davidites. In fact, the calling they set up, Nazareth, means branch. And that's what the village of Nazareth was. A branch of people from the Davidic line. And that's why Joseph and Mary were in Nazareth when the angel Gabriel appeared unto her. Their families were part of the group that left Bethlehem during that period that Antiochus Epiphanes outlawed Judaism. But this also explains why Nazareth isn't mentioned in the Old Testament. You won't find that anywhere in the Old Testament. You won't find it in the Apocrypha or the intertestamental Jewish writings or even Josephus. It didn't exist during the Old Testament period. Now remember the Old Testament period ended at the time of Malachi. As a result of that, about 400, this doesn't take place until 165 BC. So Nazareth didn't come into existence until then. So it's not mentioned anywhere in the Old Testament. It's not mentioned anywhere in the Apocrypha. It's not written in any of the Jewish intertestamental writings or even in Josephus. Yeah. Yeah. It was too new and too insignificant to be mentioned into those writings. But it was the perfect place for the Messiah to grow up. First of all, Nazareth was small and insignificant. And Jesus could grow up under the radar and completely safe. In fact, if you remember when they came back from Egypt, they were warned in a dream that Herod the great son had taken over and he was more dangerous than his father. And so they were warned not to go back to Bethlehem. So where did they go back to? The branch of Davidites, Nazareth. But the reason they went up there is because it was under the radar. It was so insignificant. If you remember, one of the disciples asked, can any good thing come from Nazareth? But the reason they said that is because those who didn't travel up there and create this colony kind of despised it. It's like, you know, you guys left. You're up there. You think you're special. Yeah. And so there had this saying, could anything good come from Nazareth? But it was the perfect place for Jesus to grow up. Secondly, he was also growing up where he could look out and he could see many of the historical places where these major events took place in the Bible. I want you to imagine Jesus sitting on the cliff on the edge of Nazareth, looking at all of the historical places in the Jezreel Valley. In fact, before I run this video, let me ask you, how many of you have ever been to Israel? 
I've been about five times. When you went to Nazareth, we went out to the cliffs, but we really didn't get to go where I wanted to go. I really had a problem. I tried not to let anyone who went with me know this. But me and the guide, we continued to bump heads. He didn't want me to speak, and every time I would speak, he would speak very long. And if he didn't have anything and he'd allow me to speak, then he'd make sure he said something after it. And whenever I asked to go to a specific place, it was horrible. But anyways, the third time I went, we went to this place called Mount Precipice. And we're sitting there, and, and we're looking out over the Jezreel Valley, and I thought, this is the place where we need to come. Because when you go to Israel, and they take you to Nazareth, you go to this village, this kind of a recreation of what Jesus would have grown up in. And it's, it, it's cool. People really like that. And you go to the Church of the Annunciation, and you see some of those places where supposedly the angel came and, and uh, told Mary that she was going to give birth to Jesus supernaturally. But where you really want to go is to the cliff, to the Mount of Precipice, because this is where they took Jesus when they were going to throw him off the hill, where they were going to throw him off the cliff. But more importantly... You get a chance to look over the Jezreel Valley. Now, you know it is the Valley of Armageddon, but that's because we know what's going to take place in the end times, right? But the Jezreel Valley is what it's called now, and it was named after Jezreel, but we'll see why. Let's run this video, and let me show you some places if you don't mind. Jesus, if you would, imagine him sitting on these cliffs. So he's sitting here. And there's Mount Tabor. So he looks to his left. And of course, that's where Deborah and Barak came down and they were fighting Sisera. Then you have Mount Moret. And Mount Moret, behind it is Jezreel, from which the valley is named. And when you see this valley, you're going, wow, this is something. This is where Ahab and Jezebel were. And then if you looked over to the right, you saw Megiddo. We know it as Armageddon because it's referred to as the mountain or the hill, Harma which means mountain, and Megiddo. So it's the mountain of Megiddo, but we call it Armageddon. We refer to this valley as the valley of Armageddon, but they know it as the valley of Jezreel. And when you look 90 degrees to the right, you see Mount Carmel. It's not Carmel. We don't put it on ice cream, and it's not in Milky Ways. It's Mount Carmel. But that's where Elijah slew the 400 prophets of Baal. So growing up, Jesus was able to sit on this cliff looking over Jezreel Valley. Take a look at this picture. This is where he would go when he was kind of all alone. He would sit up there and he would be able to look out and there was all of these famous battles that had taken place, all of these famous events that occurred. So growing up, he was able to look at this. In fact, more biblical events occurred here in this valley than anywhere else in the Old Testament. But even more importantly, because Nazareth was a Jewish city established by deeply devoted Jews who were descendants of David, Jesus would have received a first-class education in the local synagogue. Remember, these were Davidites. They were looking for the Messiah to come through one of their descendants. So education was a top priority for them. So when they traveled from Bethlehem and the surrounding villages and they set up this colony, they made sure that they had great rabbis so that when they built the synagogue, they would have a first class school. Yeah. And here's what's kind of interesting. In most synagogues, women could not attend school. But in Nazareth, it was an exception. Mary would have been allowed to attend school at the local synagogue up to the age of 12. Now, don't get me wrong, women were allowed to go to the synagogue. In fact, synagogue comes from the word synagogue. synagogue. And synagogue is a compound word. It comes from the prefix soon, which means together, and ago, which literally means to go, lead, or bring. And so it's a gathering place. It's where you go together or you bring together. And so the synagogue was more than just a church. When we think of the synagogue, we always think of the church. But because of Moses setting up these judges and they went all the way down to 10, whenever there were more than 10 Jewish males, whatever the city, 
It didn't matter where, they were required to set up a synagogue. This happened after the Babylonian captivity. Now, this synagogue wasn't just for religious purposes. You gather together for politics, you gather together kind of like a community building, but it was on the Sabbath a time to learn. But it was also used during the time of Jesus as a public school. And all male children were required to go to public school. It was supported by each community. In fact, the Jews are the ones that came up with the very first public educational system. Most of us don't realize that. But women were not allowed to go to school. They were allowed to go to the synagogue and so they would go on the Sabbath and they would listen and they understood the scriptures very well, but they, most of them were not literate. They weren't able to read, not unless they were taught because their family was wealthy from private tutorage. But in Nazareth, that wasn't the case. In Nazareth, if you were a woman, you got to go to school up to the age of 12. Because why? The Messiah is going to come through your lineage. You need to understand what's going to take place. You need to keep yourself pure. You need to understand the scriptures. You need to understand what's going to take place. And then once you reached bat mitzvah, you became a daughter of the commandment. Then you quit going to school. And as a result of that, you learned what you needed to as a woman. Now, Psalms chapter 69 tells us that Jesus had a very difficult childhood. But in spite of that, he couldn't have grown up in a better place. He received a first-rate education in a very protected environment. But it was also a place that overlooked one of the most... Famous valleys on earth because more biblical events have occurred in the Jezreel Valley than anywhere else on earth, at least from an Old Testament perspective. Now, why do I say from an Old Testament perspective? Because when Jesus comes along, he's going to do the majority of his work in Capernaum and he's going to do the majority of his work in Jerusalem. And so more things took place in Jerusalem than any other place once we look get to the New Testament. But when it comes to the Old Testament, more huge historical events took place in the Valley of Jezreel than any other place in the Bible. And to top it off by growing up in Nazareth, Jesus fulfilled a key Messianic prophecy in the book of Isaiah. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Isaiah chapter 9 verses 1 through 2. Nevertheless, that time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. The land of Zebulun and Naphtali. The land of Zebulun and Naphtali will be humbled. But there will be a time in the future when Galilee of the Gentiles. Many of these places are settled by the Gentiles. Why? Because the northern kingdom was carried off in the Assyrian uh, captivity. And if you remember after that, even though they got to come back, the Assyrians did things differently. When they took you out of their place, they brought people in. So the Samaritans were a mixed race. So the majority of people in the Galilean area were Gentiles. So it says, but there will be a time in the future when Galilee of the Gentiles, which lies along the road that runs between the Jordan and the sea, will be filled with glory. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. And who is that light? Jesus. Because that's where Jesus grew up. But he moved his headquarters to where? Capernaum. Remember, Nazareth was in the land allotted to the tribe of Zebulun. And Capernaum was in the land that was allotted to those from Naphtali. In fact, let me show you where Capernaum was on the map. Here's the Sea of Galilee up here. Capernaum is right here on the northern part of the coast. Now what's kind of interesting is is Nazareth is right here at the top part of Zebulun. It's halfway between the Sea of Galilee and to the Mediterranean Sea. But here's what's kind of interesting and most people don't know this. Jesus made Capernaum his headquarters. Anyone know why? It's because it was one of the most important parts of in the ancient world. It was one of the most important cities. And the reason it was is because it was one of the top earners for collecting taxes from customs at its tow booth. Most people don't realize this because they think that the disciples of Jesus were this ragtag, very poor people that followed Jesus. But they don't realize Matthew's family was one of the most wealthiest families in the entire world at that time. And the reason why is it was in the top four earners uh, Capernaum was 
for collecting customs or collecting taxes. And he was there collecting the taxes when Jesus came. Jesus actually called him. He left that behind in order to follow Jesus. But let me explain why it was one of the top earners. It's because it was the place you had to go when you came from the silk route from China. Or if you came from the spice route from northern Africa, if you were coming from India or Yemen or any of those places. And most people don't realize that. In fact, if you were coming up from Yemen or India, you would actually come up through what is now modern day Jordan. You would come on the King's Highway and you would get all the way to the Golan Heights. And then you would come down, uh, right down there into the Hula Valley and you would have to come to Capernaum. And there you would have to pay your taxes. If you got caught in the Jezreel Valley without uh, any type of thing saying that you paid your taxes, then all of your goods would be confiscated. Yeah. And if you were coming from China, the best way for you to get to Italy and the other parts of the Western world is for you to come through Persia, and then you would come to Syria, down the Hula Valley to Capernaum, and then you would go off to, many times, Caesarea Maritima, and then you would sell to Italy or to Egypt or to any place that you wanted to go. But you would have to pay taxes there. And so this was a hub where everyone was coming and going from distant parts, distant parts of the earth. In fact, most of you don't know this, but Marco Polo, when he was traveling to China on his big adventure, how many of you know that he, so, he sailed to Caesarea Maritima and he went through Capernaum to get to China? Most people don't know that. Yeah. He didn't come back that way because he wanted to go through Turkey and he was part of this adventure. But that's how he got to China. Now, why is it important for Jesus to set up his headquarters in Capernaum? Because that's how his fame went throughout the world. They just didn't hear about him in this little part of Galilee, in this little country. This is why Paul could say about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, this didn't happen in some forgotten corner of the world. Oh no. But the reason the fame went out is because you had people coming from India and Yemen and northern Africa, and they were going through Capernaum, which was the headquarters of Jesus, and then they were sailing to the western part, and you had those coming from the western part, and they were traveling to the eastern part. And all of these stories were being told about this rabbi who was performing all of these miracles. And so this great light, as Isaiah says, comes to the land of Zebulun, and Naphtali. And of course, it's referring to Jesus. Now, knowing that Joseph and Mary were part of a group known as Davidites explains a lot. It explains why Mary wasn't shocked when the angel Gabriel appeared to her. Scared, yes. Petrified, yes. But not shocked. It explains why she was so receptive to the news that she was going to give birth to the Messiah. Look at Luke chapter 1, verses 35 through 38. Notice what it says. The angel replied, speaking to Mary, The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. It also explains why Joseph didn't question the dream that he had about Mary. If you remember, he was going to put her away privately, but an angel appeared to him in a dream and he just immediately accepts it. He's receptive to this. Now, how many of you ever woken up from a dream and you think, was that God? That was an unusual dream. Now, if you've ever had a spiritual dream, I've only had two in my lifetime, actually three, but two that were so impactful. I knew immediately that it was. But you know, sometimes, even then you question, wow. And you look at Joseph, and Joseph never questioned it. He never questioned the news that she would supernaturally conceive, and that she was going to give birth to the Messiah. Look at Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 24. We read what the angel said to Joseph in a dream. The angel didn't appear to Joseph like he did to Mary, face to face, while she's awake. No, he did it in a dream. Notice what it says. 
This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her fiancé, was a good man. And he did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David. He's a Davidite. The angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus. For he will save his people from their sin." All of this occurred to, fulf to fulfill the Lord's message to his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, so this is all in a dream. He did as the angel of the Lord commanded and he took Mary as his wife. See, this explains why he was so receptive to it. Because he grew up in Nazareth, a branch of those from the line of David. Yeah. He grew up being taught that through their lineage, the Messiah is going to come. He grew up with a first-rate education. They were expecting at any time because that's what they studied was the Messianic Scriptures. They were expecting the Messiah to come. Now, last week we talked about what it cost Mary to be the mother of Jesus. And I want to talk a little bit more about that if you don't mind because most of us have no idea the great price that Mary paid for being the mother of Jesus. And that's because we live in a Western culture that values individuality. You see, in our culture, our identity comes from who we are as a person. When I introduce myself, I give my name and where I work. Hi, I'm Alan Nolan. I'm the pastor of Cornerstone Fellowship. That's who I am. That's my identity. But in the Middle East, at the time of Jesus, a person's place in the community was their primary source of identity, especially for women. In fact, if a woman was being introduced at the time of Jesus, and even in the Old Testament period, her tribal affiliation, her oldest son's name, and her placement within her entire extended family would be given before you ever learned her name. If you even learned her name. As an example... Hagar would have been introduced as an Egyptian handmaiden to the wife of Abraham and the mother of Ishmael. And then and only then would you learn that her name was Hagar. That was who she is or who she was. She's no longer living. That's who she was. That was her identity. Leah would be introduced as the wife of Jacob and mother of Reuben. That was who she was. That was her identity. In fact, we even go into the New Testament, we kind of see this. How many of you remember Mary Magdalene? Well, if you ever read much about Mary Magdalene, there's a lot of speculation that she was a prostitute, that, you know, she was very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Promiscuous. Before she met Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ forgave her. But one of the reasons we have all of those beliefs and tradition shows all of that is not only because Luke chapter 8 verses 1 through 2 tells us that she had seven demons cast out of her. But the reason that we believe that she was that way was because her name is given as Mary Magdalene. It doesn't say wife of. It doesn't say mother of. It doesn't give her tribal affiliation. It says Mary Magdalene. And the inference is, what we imply from that, is she wasn't married. She didn't have any children. She must have been a very bad woman. And as a result of that, most scholars... Now it's not so much this way anymore. I don't believe it. But anyways, do you remember the, the woman that came and was... Cleaning Jesus' feet with her tears. And she let her hair down. And she began to wipe it clean with her hair. Well, one of the reasons, and you guys don't get this, but if you lived in their culture, you would. A Jewish woman never let her hair down except in the bedroom. So when this woman began to cry on the feet of Jesus and let her hair down, because she didn't have a towel and began to do it, she let her hair down. And if you remember the person he was eating with, one of the Pharisees says, Ooh. If he was really a man of God, he would know what kind of woman this is. Yeah. 
And many people connect her with Mary Magdalene. But the reason you have all of these horrible stories about Mary Magdalene is because it doesn't say wife of, mother of, and it tells us that she did have a shameful past. The only insight that we get into it is Luke chapter 8 verses 1 and 2. She had seven demons that was cast out of her. But we also find that she has a very honored place in the family of God. Yeah. Now, listen to me. Because a woman's identity was based on their place in the family and their community, her actions reflected on her family and also on her community. Which meant that her actions either brought honor to the family and community or brought shame on the family and community. Their culture was what we would call an honor-shame culture. It's a culture where one member of the family, and especially women, can bring honor to the whole family or can bring shame on the whole family. And most of the time, a woman who brought shame on the family was killed in order to restore the family's honor. By killing the woman, the family avoided losing face in the community. The killing was seen as removing the stain of shame brought upon the family by the woman's actions. Now, if you were unwilling to remove the stain of shame, you would lose face in the community. From their perspective, a family could take great pride in the fact that they never allowed the stain of shame to remain on their family. In fact, you still see this in the Muslim culture today. Those from the Middle East. So even the fact that Joseph was willing to put Mary away privately instead of divorcing her publicly and having her, st her stone speaks volumes of his character. But then, after the angel appeared to him in a dream and he willingly took her as his wife, that really revealed his character and his love for God because her shame became his shame. And he lost respect in the community. I'm running out of time, so let me just kind of throw some things together. Most of you don't get this, but when Jesus went to his hometown in Nazareth, how many of you remember that he only preached one time there? And he goes back, and we hear about this in, in the book of Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 30, and Matthew chapter 13, verses 53 through 58. But he's there as the visiting rabbi. He has the place of honor. He's supposed to deliver the message. They hand him the scroll. He doesn't read what he's supposed to. In fact, he turns it to a place that talks about the Messiah, and he reads it there. And everything is going great, and they're marveling at what he says and his word. And then someone says this. Isn't he the son of Joseph? And immediately everything goes downhill. Why? Because Joseph had lost face in the community. That means he lost respect in the community. Because he did not get rid of the shame. Not only did he not divorce her, but he didn't have her stoned. And you see, once he was betrothed to her, it was like she was married to him, and therefore he didn't do an honor killing. And as a result of that, he had to put up with shame and public scorn. In fact, it's, I could go a little bit further. In Matthew chapter 15, he starts bringing up Mary, starts bringing up the other children. And the reason they remembered all of them is because they were scorned in public for what Joseph chose to do. Now, let me ask you a question. Why was Joseph and Mary willing to endure the shame and embrace the public scorn? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because in their mind, the honor of giving birth to the Messiah far outweighed the public shame. Yeah. In their mind, even though they knew what was going to take place, the honor of bringing forth the Messiah outweighed everything they were going to have to pay. Yeah. Now, let me just say this as we make some application in close. I've told you numerous times that serving God and doing His will comes with a cost. In other words, there's always a price to pay. That's why Jesus told us in Luke chapter 14 verse 27 in the first part of verse number 28 to count the cost if you're going to follow Him. Notice what these verses say. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. But don't begin until you count the cost. Jesus knew very well because not only did he have to put up with public scorn because he was an illegitimate child. 
And yes, as an illegitimate child, you have the curse of the bastard and you cannot be in the public assembly or the assembly of the people until the 10th generation. Of course, he's not an illegitimate child. He's born supernaturally. He's conceived by the Holy Spirit. But that's one of the reasons they didn't accept him in Nazareth as a rabbi because of that. Deuteronomy chapter 23 verse 2. But Jesus himself had to suffer shame in order to redeem us. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, the last part of verse 1 and verse 2. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor besides God's throne. People, I want you to understand something. Jesus himself had to endure shame before he received honor. The apostles had to do the same. I'm not going to read the scripture, but you can find it in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 9 through 13. Paul says, we were treated like human garbage. We did this so that you might become children of God. And the Bible is very clear that we might have to suffer shame and public scorn to serve God and to do his will, especially in today's culture. Let me show you two verses. Matthew chapter 5 verse 11 says, God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Not because it's true. You don't get any honor if it's true. But if they do these things because you're a Christian, because you stand up for Jesus, you're going to be blessed. You're going to receive honor. Maybe not on this earth, but in the life to come. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 20 kind of expands on that, expounds on that. It says, of course, you get no credit for being patient if you're beaten for doing wrong. But if you suffer for doing good and do it patiently, God is pleased with you. Now, why in the world would I teach on this at Christmas time? Well, I'll tell you why. Christmas teaches me that to be honored in heaven might require that I have to endure shame and public scorn on this earth. When I see Jesus in the poor humble circumstances that he was born in, when I see his childhood and I read about it in the book of Psalms, the Messianic Psalms, when I understand their culture, when I see what Mary and Joseph went through, when I see how Jesus was treated, when I see what he had to endure in order to redeem me, one of the things that I learned from Christmas is that in order to do God's will, in order to follow him, I might have to endure shame and public scorn. But there's a great honor to receive. Mary and Joseph were not temporal minded. They didn't have a temporal mentality in other words. They had an eternal mentality. They understood, Mary did of course, more than anyone. That if I accept this job. If I accept what God is wanting to do. And I give birth to the Messiah. I'm bringing upon myself and my family shame. And public scorn. But the honor in doing God's will. The honor of giving birth to the Messiah. Is worth it. If I have to face this my entire life on this earth. For the eternal rewards. It's worth it. We live in a very materialistic society. Christmas is all about gifts. Let me tell you something. The greatest gift in the world is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ. And if you never receive a gift on this earth, if you never receive all the things you want to do on this earth, but you get to heaven and you get to serve God, it was well worth it.